Dripping with immortal flame, the master potter has molded thee of that substance of himself, that radiance which comes from celestial spheres and draws nigh to mankind at the moment of birth to infuse him with the passion of life for life, of eternal life, for eternal life. The moment of birth, fraught with all its fragility, is a moment when the angelic host draw very near unto the mother form and manifest round about her the radiance of the light of birth, clothing her and the incoming child as with swaddling garments, the aurora of the dawn and the potency of God charged in to the fashioning of a living soul. Ye came forth, one and all, thusly. Ye came forth into the world of form, Fashioned in hope, a beautiful hope, a wonderful image traced by the fingers of God upon the plastic substance of Akasha, the cross, the meeting ground, the trysting place of the Most High God, the moment of birth, whether that birth be a physical one or the celestial moment when the soul and its living fount of flame substance, infused with the intelligence of Almighty God, also came with holy innocence into manifest form. For the soul with its formless radiance is also able to take on form and substance. The soul with its beautiful patterns is able to weave its own garments of substance. And when men understand, as the ascended masters do, the power of life to command as well as to obey, they will recognize that the duality of life is the duality of God and man. Man destined to become more than man, and God destined to manifest himself in the world of form, fashioning those lovely, fragile shapes of the angelic host that cluster round about the incoming child and bring awareness through the portal of birth to the incoming child and to the mother of that which God intends. At that moment, at inner levels, the mother is charged with understanding which she cannot voice or articulate so that others would understand. This incomprehensible moment is the wonder of being made manifest. Yet the little one who comes in surrounded with the angelic host does not know in the outer 
all that is being accomplished at inner levels. I would take you now to what we call the Great Hall of Images. I would permit those of you who are able to see in this mighty hall the mirrors of divine perfection. Have you seen the beauty of Leonardo da Vinci's work? Have you seen the beauty of the mighty sculptors of the Renaissance? Have you seen upon this planet the beautiful radiance of an angel in sculptured marble? Let me now ask that you will come with me to a place where God is, where in the magnificent hall of images there are statues, so to speak, made of living spirit fire, being so majestic as to set your hearts on fire, beings from which images your soul was framed, beings of such images as by God were named. Cherubim celestial, seraphim, and of the holy order of angels, beings of light and celestial radiance, beings who are unaffrighted by the ideas of mortals, but are completely at home with God and with the powers of the great creative essences. Understand then that out from the Godhead and the central sun, paeans of praises are pouring out from the great central sun, the love light is adoring all that which makes one out of creation. Pouring then into manifestation, there is the outgoing breath of Almighty God, and then there is the return currents, the currents of life as the life waves return to the heart of God. Purpose, purpose of God, is served by manifestation, purpose of conveyance, whereby the infinite Father is able to convey upon the Son the conscious gift of himself, making known by the power of free will how that a living soul can come in to its own sovereign birthright. Ye have a mortal birthright, one claimed by name and fame, but above, in that realm of the nameless ones, there is only the consciousness of being. And that consciousness is not limited by the conscription of form, but it is the consciousness of immortality, born and reborn. As waves of glory transcendent pass from one glory celestial to another, as man then becomes that which is more than man, it is as though you were in form able to leap from cloud to cloud of cosmic glory and comprehend in all that this is the infinite story of yourself as you become daily more like him, for you see him as he is. That holy thing, which was born of Mary is that holy thing which came forth from the cosmic mother and to all upon the planetary body the moment of birth is the solemnity of that occasion when energy takes form and dimension and a living soul is breathed forth but the moment the greatest moment of all to the angelic host is not the physical birth, but the birth of spiritual essence when the sunburst of cosmic reality comes forth into the world of spirit as an individual filled with the hope of being that which God intends. Sees then that masterful moment, that fragile moment, that blessed moment, recognize that it is a moment upon the wind of the Holy Spirit when you are brought forth in order to take command of your own world. I would to God that at this moment I could draw you into my mind and heart and very close 
that I might impart unto you the beauty which I see and which I bear witness to. I would to God that I could lift the veil from your eyes of flesh and convey to you as I did unto my beloved Mary, Ave Maria, the beauty that all of God is, which is veiled from your eyes because it is necessary. You may at this moment ask me why it is necessary. O oh, blessed ones, in the light of God, there is such transcendent flame and such transcendent power that those who are not qualified to be able to see and witness for themselves would actually burn up the orbs of vision and destroy themselves by a burst of sudden blindness because of the great fire of God, which they are not yet accustomed to. And therefore, mercy has tempered unto mankind even the power of vision, for men must walk up the cosmic ladder of life by steps and by a series of moments of progress. Otherwise, it would mean an end to the power of being rather than a beginning. For in the realm of the nameless ones who have adapted for themselves the mighty name of God I am, the new name is known and understood. And each stair step on the vaster cycles of life becomes a thing of great beauty whereby the individual ponders moment by moment upon that beauty as though they could not go another step. And they say unto us often, O oh, beloved escorts of divine grace, show us no more, for we cannot even now understand or comprehend that which we see. And when we hear that cry, we know that that blessed one has had enough, enough for a moment until at last, there comes a state in their development where once again they cry out, show us more. Understand then how that life seems filled with discrepancies from the human level. First there is the call, show us no more, we cannot bear it. And then as hunger once again surges to the surface within the soul springing up as a well of immortal life, the soul cries out, show us more once again. And thus step by step, Men are led until the face of God becomes very real to them and the angelic host and the cosmic presences become their best of friends and next of kin. What is the meaning of kinship? It is the kindling. What is the meaning of the kindling? It is the essence of the sacred fire coming into preeminence in the world where men are able to love the fire even as they love the lesser images below. And after all, in the legend of Narcissus, you will behold certain laws of spiritual growth. In the legend of Narcissus, you will come to know that it is not the outer self or the glamour which is bestowed upon mankind that is the beauty of life, but it is rather the divine intent, the holy image which God has created for each soul and fashioned as his own native identity. The native identity of God seems at times to hide behind many screens of illusion. And I call your attention now to the power of life resident within your own force field. I call to your attention the great radiance that is within that force field, much of which has been veiled from your outer eyes and you have recognized yourselves as just so much mortality and have often felt that this mortality could not properly love its own divinity. Understand then how that out of the divinity the mortality came into form and it is the frozen essence of immortality which creates the illusion of mortality. Now out of mortality Immortal flames will burst into being and the radiance of those flames will kindle a new hunger within your souls, fashioning a mighty cosmic lodestone as a star of light before your eyes until you can journey to the place where God lays, the place within being, the place of the magi, the place of holiness, the place of grasp, grasp of spiritual principle, grasp of immortality, grasp of identity, and all that identity holds, recessed within the folds of being, both above and below, as above, so below, 
and transitory indeed for a moment, but eternal forever. Transitory for a moment as that which is unborn, as that which is not yet formed. But when the Christ is formed, immortal within thyself, and the substance thereof of his being becomes thy own substance, then honor of honors is bestowed upon thee. And truly the words of God come to life within thy frame and within thy flesh, and thou also, as the blessed holy ones who witnessed the Christ, being patriarchs to the moment of his appearing, did say, Mine eyes have seen the salvation of God, and he has showed me himself in flesh. Thus when men see and are witnesses to that which is born of their own flesh, that which is spirit which gave birth to the flesh, and that which will immortalize it, raising it into higher dimensions, they can acknowledge that God has fulfilled his purpose within themselves. How many today upon this planet stoop to lesser images is a statement which I do not even choose to enlarge upon, for mankind are so often caught up in such smallness as would be belittling to the God flame within. And therefore, as an archangel, I, Raphael, choose to amplify the power of God good. I choose to amplify the power of holy innocence within thyself. Some of you have seen the magnificent paintings executed by the master artists down through the ages. You have seen in these paintings the cherubic faces of the angelic host as a celestial color shining through the work of a Titian, the work of a magnificent painter and you have gloried in those for a moment. What then, when stripped of mortal ideas, when stripped of mortal concepts, you shall see as the rainbow colors of pure light, undiluted by mortal substance, fashion before your eyes, the eyes of the spirit, the wondrous faces of these holy innocents. How then shall ye know that which is truth, which has been so long hidden? How shall ye know how shall ye rejoice properly only because ye have executed the initiatic process and stepped up the stairs of cycle to the place where you are able to appreciate the majestic and magnificent art which God reveals by the power of the infinite spirit. This is light and it is a penciled sunbeam descending through the atmosphere filled with the truculence of mankind and erasing all of that wherever the shaft does glow, and bringing to mankind upon the canvas there below the essence of the holy innocence, the beauty of the age is celestial, appearing for a brief moment in the face of a child, and as the light of hope in the eye of one of more mature dimensions. This is the unfailing light of God, the celestial star of the firmament of being, which brings and conveys to mankind the great buoyant, joyous faith of the angelic host. Now the angelic hosts are very near unto mankind, but because of mortal fear, we are often repelled and driven away. This is why in the eyes of a child there is that love luster, that magnificence of faith, which draws the angelic host to that child and keeps the look of holy innocent upon that countenance so mild, oh, so majestic, so infused with the light of the risen Christ. For there is in the face of some of the children of the earth all that which is majestic and of worth. But unfortunately in others there is that exhibition of mortality which is a perpetuation of old embodiments when lust and pain and despair took their toll and brought upon the mortal form all of the etchings of deep grooved disappointment, all of the sordid qualities of life which you see stamped as a mold of decaying substance upon men who walk as whited sepulchers among you now. Oh, shake that off, that concept, blessed ones, and put on in its place the immortal Christ image. When you see an individual walking the streets of life who comes before you with all of these negative qualities in manifestation, call to me and the powers of light. Call to your own beloved Mother Mary and to the world Mother to erase all that turmoil, all that distress, all that is not of the light and replace it by God virtue, stamping the holy, innocent, noble form upon that blessed light substance which that individual is. 
and erasing all that which the individual is not, the shreds of illusion and decaying substance. Death is stamped upon them from the beginning of their being. They come into the world with tired, old, and ancient forms because these forms are conveyed by the intensity of basic feelings which are not wedded to the light. Consecrate yourself then to removing from the flesh forms of man and from your own form these concepts of light which have been distorted and replace it rather by the beauty of the light which has not been distorted, which comes forth free and clear and pure. The mighty continents of the air, the mighty untrammeled continents where the angelic hosts are, these are the realm of the holy innocence. Angels of my band, angels of Raphael's heart, angels of Mary's heart, angels of the world mother, descend. Angels of the world mother, defend the holy images of God, the holy image of God, the masterwork of creation. Let the morning stars Sing together for joy, for joy is present in our octave. Let the joy of the Eternal One flood the world of form with hope, and let the tender faces of the youth of the world take on the beautiful shapes of holy innocence. If I seem to come to you this day with one note, bear well in mind that it is a note of harmonium, Bear well in mind that it is intended to arouse within your feeling world the God passion of the master builder, the God passion of the master painter, the God passion of the cosmic artist. Work, serve, and love the light. For the light is the source of your freedom. And the light draws the holy family together in a cosmic closeness of purpose, every family on earth is intended to be a holy family with a star of God shining above it, the father person representing God, the mother person representing the cosmic mother, and the incoming child representing the sun consciousness of the eternal sun. Everyone in that family is the divine kin, and cosmic kinship is not so much of the blood as it is of the life essence, the spirit that makes of all men brothers captive to his heart by their will, wedded to his principle, and desiring to fulfill all that is of cosmic purpose broad, the comprehension of the mighty road of eternal life, wending its way through time and space until men and women come to that place of cosmic surrender where there is born in them the mighty thought that first came forth and to the Christ brought awareness of himself. Lo, I am come to do thy will, O God. Thus is born in earthly dimensions the comprehensions that sustain the ideals of an avatar. Oh, how men seek for an avatar, blessed ones. How they do seek indeed. And I will tell you something with God's speed about it all. They desire to place mankind upon a pedestal of hope. And when those hopes do fail and men find that their images have feet of clay, how quickly they dash them down as though it were a poisonous thing. Yet God, speaking of old through the living Christ, did say unto Peter, that which God hath cleansed, that call thou not common or unclean. For whom God has received, he is able to cleanse. And all men, even the most desperate of men from the pages of historical past, those who have wrought great acts of destruction upon humanity are also in many cases sons of light. 
who have gone the wrong pathway. Return then one and all, saith the Father unto the Son. Return then, O ye prodigal ones, and witness the holy innocence of thyself, and see that the Christ must be formed within ye. Within yourselves ye must form that Christ by immaculate faith called forth from God. You must not be satisfied with the mere desire to seek in some earthly story, some earthly concept, some contact with an earthly individual, a manifestation of cosmic beauty, but in all and in thyself. For when men do see that the icons they have created are not worthy of the Christ image and they dash them down, they often reap a karma because they have created this image of the other person and then have cast it down. Let all then learn and understand the meaning of the cosmic honor flame that honors God's name and honors identity in all parts of life. When you honor identity, God identity in other parts of life, is it not in preference, gracious ones, to the idea of honoring ego density? Ego density is that dense substance which mankind have accepted upon their world, the impositions of others as well as misqualified substance in their own world. They have taken forth from the Most High God the holy stream of his light, and they have misqualified that substance with human vibratory action, clothing that substance that came forth pure from the heart of God with all of the negative concepts of their own impurities. This then returns to the screen of their mind and life for redemption again and again. And it is also true, precious ones, that others do project their own thoughts of negation concerning life into the force field of other people and out into the world as a general radiation of negation from their own physical being and from their own being. This too must be called forth and reclaimed and every jot and every tittle of energy which mankind create as a law of their own being and then emanate forth into the world of form must one day be reclaimed by them. It must be reborn in them and then it must be requalified by the substance of light and perfection and beauty and wholeness. I realize full well that this may seem to some of you who gaze upon your lives and recall for a moment with a flash of horror all of the density which you have created in times past, some feeling that perhaps you will never be able to repay all of your debts to life. I say then that this is a moment when I wish I could use a certain word with authority which you have upon this planet, and I hope you will not think me undignified as an archangel if I use it, for I use it as emphasis to create the idea in your own mind of just how we feel about it. That is the word bosh. I say to you, bosh. It is ridiculous for individuals to think for one moment that the power of life which beats their heart cannot also cleanse them and make their garments as white as snow. It does not matter if you have spent millions of years, precious ones, in building a momentum of negation. Think of the wonderful momentum of divine ideation that exists right now within your mighty causal body, the world of first cause. Think of all of the loving thoughts you have also thought and of the services which you have rendered and of your desire to be better than you are in manifestation. Think of those things. Think on those things of good report, those things which are lovely and virtuous, and hold unto them and recognize that other conditions have no power in your world except the power that you have given them. Recall that power now in the name of God and say unto your mighty divine presence, I am in you. I call to you, my beloved presence, to take all the misqualified substance of my world into the mighty transmuting violet flame and see that this day I breathe the air of freedom in God's name. I say, let that substance be requalified by the concepts of holy innocence and the innocence of the pure God flame and the qualification of the divine intent and the qualification of the angelic host and the mighty cosmic bent of life that determines to shoot an arrow into the infinite and strike that cosmic mark 
with a mighty shower of divine grace, a cosmic spark that will ignite the entire firmament of a man's being until he no longer feels the mighty shrouds he has created around himself of limitation, but speaks unto those shrouds and saith, you are no longer mighty, you have no power in my world. I am free by the light of God from all darkness and despair, from all hopelessness that has been there, and I replace you now by my own cosmic vow renewed, the vow that determines once again to see the angelic host face to face, to take my place in the great cosmic caravan of life that moves forward and onward and upward and determines that mankind are going to also move forward into the light without fail and by faith and by action and by grace and by perfection and by fulfillment of the cosmic race. The light shines today and it is the light of hope. The light shines today and it is no joke, blessed ones, it is the solemnity of the cosmic moment. It has come forth. It has come into your midst this day. And it is a moment of celestial beauty which your souls can seize and use to refute all of the mortal things that men have done in the banality of ignorance which has not for one moment won for them the innocence and the beauty of their own precious life which God has given to them to beat their heart. Won't you please be seated, precious ones? Where is the sun? Where has the sun of your being gone? Has the sun gone down? Through the sphere of being, the sun still shines. And the sun is the sun of his presence, so divine, so beautiful. As I have spoken to you this day, out of the light, a number of ascended masters have stepped forth, and they are here with you now at inner levels. 27 feet above your heads, they are, and they are pouring light into this place, into the beings who are here in flesh form to convey to you an inner understanding of all that I have said and of all that I have thought and all that God has wrought. Understand then how that a renewal of the covenant is in order for all, the covenant that will make you not an assembly of cohesive dust, mortal substance, and mortal rust, but rather light expanding into new dimensions as a sun pours out concentric rings of color, magnificence, and joy. There is in the angelic host tonight a renewed hope that life will expand upon this planet the power of hope and faith in this dark hour when it is needed, as you will find out more and more as this class proceeds. For heaven is drawing very near in this class of Malta, very near unto outer mankind. And as heaven draws near, individuals will learn to have less fear, and they will see appear within themselves the chrysalis of the aborning Christ returning suddenly to his temple to exhibit magnificent God control over the holy innocent pathway of the soul that leads through the trackless wilderness of mortality to the infinite cosmic reality of life as its tides of infinite light descend and envelop the farm below and say unto that farm, I am all aglow with heaven's renewed fashion of cosmic wonder, transcending all mortal passion and mortal blunder, and releasing mankind into the flame that is their reality in God's name. I breathe out upon you 
a renewal of hope. And this hope comes from your own God presence through the feeling of the archangels. And that hope shall remain fixed within you according to the dimensions of your thought, whether it be little or great. Therefore, this moment, make that thought great and rape great rewards. Reap the greatest reward, the ascension of the holy innocence of thyself into the light. This is the golden pot, the golden potential at the end of the rainbow of being at the beginning of the rainbow of seeing completion cycles freeing revealing concealing and causing all to have the divine feeling of freedom 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 within their world God seal it now Ladies and gentlemen, in the name of heaven and heaven's sons, in the name of the archangels, every one, I say, let hope expand. I thank you. Let me
tenderly be loving. May we ask that tiredness and fatigue shall recede from your consciousness. May we ask that the mighty power of awareness shall flow into the domain of your being. May we ask that you become aware of the tireless infinite energies of the light, of the universal Christ, and of the domain of ascended master love. You are beings of spiritual fire. Your bodies are not able to transport yourselves into our domain. But the wings of the mind are able to fly from the body temple by a simple impulse, by the desire to be united, by the fire of the heart. Men are able to escape the cage of the body and to enter into the limitless expanse of spiritual joy. As the light of the dawn tinges the wave with the brightness of its coming, so out of the mystic east comes the light unto the west, not to bring about a greater degree of machination, but to bring about understanding and peace. The world today, my brothers and sisters of light, is one of a hurried pace where the hearts of men do often quake in terror of nameless situations which they do not yet understand. Secret doubts and fears fill the minds of mankind and the wares in the marketplaces are a pull upon the attention. Often, in weariness, individuals close their eyes with gratitude, not caring whether or not the morrow shall dawn for them. Yet the love of a father, an infinite God, has created and framed them. The world today has inherited a passion of mortal woe which ought to be lulled from their consciousness by the passion of truth. You may wonder or question why I have used the word lull. It is because of the great cosmic mother's love who takes the tiny child and holds the tiny child of the man individual. Whether that individual be an infant, a little form, or a larger form, a mature one, and holds that form in her arms and rocks that child to sleep by the spiritual lullaby of cosmic integration. Integration into the eternal heart, for there are no adults to the cosmic mother, but only a sea of children, tired and hungry and empty and longing to be filled with her love. Out of the East comes the idea of the world mother, and the banner of the cosmic mother blazes forth, not only in Shambhala, but through the universe that men may behold the new Eve, mother of all that live, that men may behold and understand that her arms of tenderness do enfold the world to assuage it against its own acts of undoing. The ball of yarn which men have snarled again and again today is in a very difficult state indeed, my brothers and sisters of light. And before the lords of karma and the great holy councils, 
We have listened to the prayers of the few which are raised and are so beautiful in comparison to the prayers of the many which are lowered. May I say to you now that only the few pray with understanding and say with all of their heart, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done. The multitudes today are calling and the cult of mankind today which has invaded by its subtlety emanating from the brothers of the shadow into the world of form and masquerading as a spiritual ideal seeks to enliven mankind with a consciousness of mere mortal prosperity not yet conveying to mankind the understanding of the law which states so clearly seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you by the fulfillment of the law, the hearts of men rejoice. But when a partial manifestation occurs, and it is only a means of supplying outer creation to mankind, and the inner creation is starving, are mankind then not indeed naked and without goods, although they be increased in the realm of mortal things? A man's life, my brethren, consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. For the possessions of mankind are often the very things which possess him. And therefore he does not understand how that the law of divine grace, the law of cosmic supply, is in the cosmic search whereby men desire to first present themselves at the altar of life and then receive from God the gift of his divine presence and divine grace. I pause that ye may absorb, that ye may comprehend that men hear our words again and again, yet continue in wrongdoing and reap that which they sow, which is wrong. Now then the council has sat again and again and debated as to how we shall raise a sovereign people, a people ordained by God into the full magnitude of their own divine flame. Lest there be imparted here tonight a measure of misunderstanding, let me say that there does not exist in this activity in the United States a group of dedicated people as exists in this city of Los Angeles. I call this to your attention that you may know that I have seen and that Almighty God has seen the dedication of the people of this city in this activity and of how they have again and again fostered an outpouring of light for all mankind a nationalistic spirit, a spirit of a city, is not precious ones a thing to be spurned when that spirit is dedicated to holy principles. Let it be known then that those who feel that we are showing some form of partiality must understand that the law cannot be denied and it is the law which must be acknowledged. Therefore, I must tonight Acknowledge your service because it is great. But I cannot tonight or at any other time deny to you the fact that there is much need for improvement nonetheless. And I am certain that you will aspire to fulfill this under our guidance in the future, even as you have fulfilled it under our guidance in the past. Yet the powers of light are moving forward all over the planet and there are millions of hungry hearts that are receiving new degrees of spiritual enlightenment which cause us to hope that the tide of negative aggression against the powers of light and the nefarious activities of the brothers of the shadow may yet be brought under control by the power of the infinite light of the cosmic Christ. First of all, 
I have told you these things, but now I shall tell you in all sincerity that upon this planet, less than 1% of the population are illumined as to the activity of the hordes of darkness which do control and manipulate mankind and mass, although they do full well recognize that that which they seek to control and that which they do control in part is but a small portion of the energy which they use, much of that energy being corrected. You must understand by the calls of the children of light. And also another portion of that energy, precious ones, being rejected by mankind because of the high moral standard which yet exists upon this planet in the hearts of many of the mothers and fathers. And also I am happy to report in the hearts of the youth of the world who have been depicted to be so awful and so degrading in their concepts. It is often the few who mar the image of the many and yet the great banal ignorance which exists upon this planet which causes so many people to do so many frightful things and create such a schism within their own world is an activity that is far too great in this age when the golden age itself is about to complete its first manifestation so that all may see and know that the power of the light from on high is descending to answer the calls of men. Ladies and gentlemen, as I come to you tonight, it is in full awareness of the needs of the hour. I am fully aware of the needs individually of those in this group, as are all the ascended masters. And at times we will supply those needs right in your midst, creating the matrix of manifestation, creating the matrix of precipitation, and preparing the way to reveal just how the light can be expanded. At other times, we will plant a seed within your consciousness which will become fertile, and it will expand, and the light of that seed will fill the world with the brightness of Christ in his appearing through you and your brothers and sisters of light, not only in this city, but all over the planetary body. Consider, precious ones, at this moment, how many are waiting for our radiation. As I am speaking to you, I want you to know that over one million people are receiving the radiation consciously. These individuals, precious ones, do not know exactly what is taking place but they are aware of a spiritual activity of great light that is pouring through their own form and consciousness. Do you see then how many people are being influenced by the power of our spoken word, beamed forth by the power of the infinite light of God? This light pulsates in ye all. Some of you are aware of it to a greater degree. Some of you are aware of it to a lesser degree. And I regretfully say that a few do not sense the pulsations, but are aware of peace and that there is an activity taking place which they do not thoroughly understand or comprehend, but which they are listening to with open ears and heart. In this city, fair ones of the light, there are many, many hungry souls who do not even know how to open their consciousness to their divine presence. Would it not be then a blessed thing this night when you go into the realm of sleep before you leave that you breathe a prayer for the people of Los Angeles, those lost angels of the divine presence, those individuals who have lost contact with their own divine presence in a conscious manner, who are unaware of the great power of life and light, the mighty flood tides of cosmic existence, 
which are pouring through the atmosphere and which they do not sense, which they do not feel. In effect, precious ones of the light, they are as though they were indeed deceased and without life. Spiritually speaking, they walk as the sleepwalkers walk. Indeed, they are not conscious of any quality of light whatsoever, but only of the mortal senses. They are able to see, they are able to taste and to feel and to hear, and they possess the faculties of the senses. But those senses are turned in and inverted toward outer things, and they cannot see even one little atomic explosion from a spiritual level. Do you realize what this means to them to be cut off from the great feeling of God integration? Would it not be then an act of cosmic wisdom to ask that all who hear my words and all who read my words and all who understand the impulse that prompts me to speak will make a call every night for all mankind that they may turn from the servitude of mortal senses to be able to search that the spiritual eye of light within them shall open upon the cosmic world with all of its beauty and wonder. Those of you who are able to see me, those of you who are able to feel me to a larger degree, ought to make a very special call this night because to you much has been given and from you much is expected. You are intercessors then by divine appointment this night intercessors for others whose senses are closed that they may know God and may know the power of his love and may feel the rays of the cosmic mother is our prayer. For now, as we have pondered again and again upon the world situation and have reviewed a historical past that is unknown to many of you, we conclude after a great deal of deliberation that the culture of the world mother is the one magnificent idea which may indeed in this age break the spiritual impasse which has been created around mankind by an activity of entrenched religion without the benefit of a cosmic spirituality. A religion, precious ones, that is not infused with the power of the divine light, a religion that is not progressive and quickening to mankind, is indeed like unto dead men's bones. Those who pursue and follow the course of that action are often whited sepulchers. On the outside they have and manifest a form of religion, but within themselves there is no contact with the divine presence, no flash of the cosmic fire, no comprehension of the light in one another. And I want to point out to you that one of the saddest words about all this is that they often meet ascended masters appearing in mortal form upon the street and pass them by without even feeling the radiation of their light. And they often do not recognize one another. That is to say, they do not recognize the light in one another to the fullest degree which they could if they would but apply themselves in a greater measure to the cosmic light. Now I must be honest with you this night, as I always have been. I must point out to you that there is a human tendency for individuals to sometimes become spiritually complacent, whereby because they have received great cosmic advancement, great spiritual blessings, they are just a little bit inclined to say, I have a great deal of spiritual things and I do not particularly need as much as others may need. I want to say to you now, in the eyes of God, that the great master of wisdom himself desires that I convey to you from the very heart of the great central sun the power of the sun radiance of God concerning this fact. There are no individuals at the unascended level who are completely self-sufficient, precious ones. Everyone needs to be bathed in the light of a new spiritual faith each day. Every individual needs and requires contact with the ascended masters and their own divine presence each day. There is never a time when individuals can actually afford from a spiritual standpoint to sit back and say, I have all spiritual things under my control. 
The need is very great even for the most advanced among mankind. And we find a very strange attitude persisting even in the realm of the ascended masters where I have actually eavesdropped upon Master Moria and I have heard him say to Saint Germain, I must get busy about the Lord's business lest I should myself not take full advantage of the great cosmic light that is coming out from the central sun in flood tides tonight. I must be there, I must be active, I must be doing, I must take action lest it pass me by. I say to you then tonight, if this can be true of an ascended being, do you not think it ought to be true of yourself? And I think that you will admit it, and I think that you will recognize that one of the great driving powers that comes about as the result of our coming into your midst is that you receive a transfusion of our essence which is just a little bit greater than that which you ordinarily manifest. And because of this transfusion, there is an activity that tends to clarify the confusion of the mortal mind, beset as it is by a host of outer world tyrants who absolutely seem to seek to rob you of your peace and your harmony when you want it so very badly. Won't you please be seated, ladies and gentlemen? I want to thank you for your ovation, and I want to thank you for your love, but I urge upon you the putting to use of every divine impulse for and on behalf of the light. There is a grave danger that has come to the planet of which you know very little about this night. I cannot tonight, here at this first meeting, reveal it to you, but we have discussed these matters at inner levels, and there is a grave concern that fills our minds this night for the planetary body. We have examined the karmic record of the entire planet, and we do it often. You might call it taking your baby's temperature. I say to you that this is often necessary for us because there is a constant state of flux upon the planet. And who can help today see what is taking place in the world and not recognize it? You surely must know, beloved ones, that the tumult within the world today is greater than it was a year ago and greater than it was yesterday. And yet there has been a mounting activity of a spiritual nature within the framework of the world order. This has not been enough. And therefore, when we have had recent conclaves of the Indian Council and of the Darjeeling Council in a joint session, we have recognized the seriousness of this situation and we have determined that this class of Malta, your own beloved St. Germain's class of Malta, shall be an opportunity which we will do our best to provide the mankind of Earth and the recipient ones of our love with a fuller understanding of the dangers now besetting the Earth and show you how you can countermand those dangers not only within your own world but also within the greater world at large. For in a very real sense, you are all very close to one another. You do not always understand this, for one often loses perspective because of the inflow of thoughts impinging upon the aura and consciousness of mankind. But when individuals stop for a moment, the hurrying pace that they have set for themselves, and they begin to recognize the great love tides of God and the true picture of the world situation, not only in a historical sense, but in a sense of reading the auras of the world at large, then they are able to better understand all that is happening here in the world of form. Some of you may wonder why I said reading the auras of the world. Because, precious ones, the world has many auras, not just a single solitary aura, but an aura from within the earth, from the strata of the rock and from the core from within the heart of the earth and from the sun of even pressure. It has the aura of the people. The animal kingdom has its own aura. The vegetable kingdom has its own aura. The atmosphere, all has its own aura. And we are able to read it all and to evaluate it. But it is constantly in a state of change. And it is this state of change which presents the danger to mankind, which you will no doubt, if you are receptive and attentive, learn more about as the class progresses and is orderly in every way, bringing about an opportunity for the great ones to release flood tides of light into the world. 
throughout the city and to assist the planetary body in maintaining its balance in the face of every negative condition which the outer world has continually fashioned in ignorance, in superstition, and in darkness. Yet, the need remains for expansion of the children of the light. And I think because of your great dedication that you are accomplishing something in the name of Almighty God, something of which you can be justly proud. Yet, I think you will bear with me when I say that in this terrible time, even pride in spiritual things is not enough to stop mankind in their resistless road down toward enslavement and bondage and destruction. Therefore, have faith, have hope, and have charity. Let it be a limitless feeling from your heart that is directed now into the chalice of the world order. Understand that as ye all join with the ascended masters, with the Indian Council this night, in thinking of freedom, you will raise its banner. Freedom's banner must be raised, and the cross of Malta is a manifestation of your own beloved Saint Germain and Jesus. It is a manifestation of the world mother. It is a manifestation of Ave Maria. It is a manifestation of the threefold flame, the fleur de lis. It is a manifestation of the power of Archangel Michael's sword that cuts men free from the bondage of negative thoughts, that cuts men free from the bondage of negative feelings, that teaches mankind that the living Christ walks among men, that his voice is heard in their own heart and mind, that his voice is the voice of light, and that the council does tonight urge upon you all a greater amount of listening. Let your inward ear become attuned to the great cosmic power. Let your inward ear be attuned to the cosmic voice. Let your inward ear be attuned to the world mother and understand that the power of the great bonds of cosmic love is being implemented tonight through the great power resident within the cross of Malta. The cross of Malta is a balanced cross. It is a cross flooded with the power of transmutation. It is a power that is brought into the world at a time when it is most needed. The hour is now. Now is the time. Now is the hour. This minute is the minute when the cross of Malta is being energized, when change is being introduced, not for change's sake, but because it is long overdue. This change is not for the few. This change is for the many, for all mankind. But those who will not awake, those who will not listen, those who do not understand, those who will not seek, we cannot do anything about it, precious ones, for only the Heavenly Father can awaken and quicken their hearts. Only the World Mother can speak to these children. You have heard the voice of God within your own souls. You have hearkened. You have sought to obey. But you must be led further and further into the intense understanding of the law. Now I wish to speak. I wish to speak directly to those students who have for many years pursued the spiritual course. I want to say to you who are advanced, not only in your own eyes, but in the eyes of the ascended masters, there are many moot and subtle points which are often missed by the students of light because they are not always able in their own minds to find the time to ponder those moot and subtle points. There are many times when a great spiritual law is given into your hands and use and simply because you think for a moment that you do not have the time to read that particular item of a spiritual nature, you pick up something else and read it or you do something else and that is lost to you forever in a sense of the word. For the now is the forever. And when time passes and you do not pick it up at that moment, it may require some cycling of the wheel of the law before the selfsame opportunity will once again come forth into manifestation and comprehension into your own world. Precious ones, you'd never know how much a little thought can mean to you. For example, tonight, as I take leave of you, I am going to leave you a little thought, a thought 
which I hope will spur you on to know that you can win the prize. Here in our retreat, we have a young boy from your own country, America. This young boy come to us only three weeks ago, three weeks ago, and today he is already a candidate for the resurrection flame. And there is hope that this young boy will within seven years be a candidate for the ascension. I want to point out to you that this boy is only 12 and a half years old. And I want to call this to your attention that you may understand that at any moment in time or space, when you resolve it, you can receive a tremendous assistance. This boy, at the age of nine, made a spiritual resolve of great intensity, and his aura was increased to such a size by that resolve and vow which he never broke that he was called to the attention of the Indian Council by Serapis Bay himself. And therefore, he is now here taking a special training to be sent to the Temple of the Resurrection Flame and then to the Ascension Temple. Within the next seven years, he may well be one who will answer the call when you say, Spirit of the Great White Brotherhood, manifest now. For he, it is hoped, will indeed ascend. We have long ago, however, learned since the experience with Krishnamurti that it is not always desirable to reveal to mankind the names of these individuals or bring them into manifestation in the outer world. For when mankind come into manifestation in the outer world, they become immediately targets for all types of mortal hostility. Individuals seek to break them down, to cause them to be examined as under a fine and minute microscope. I would call this to your attention because it is always true of our messengers. For when anyone takes the position before the world of form and stands up and permits themselves to be used by the ascended masters as their messenger, or they go out into the world of form and pick up the cross of cosmic service, there is always a tendency on the part of everyone to examine them with a minute look to finding some flaw. Remember that St. Germain has long ago, as was told to you this night, possess the power of mending the flaw. And in one of your own songs to liberty and freedom, you have the statement, God mend our every flaw. Understand then the law, that while all mankind may have flaws, the power is resident within your own mighty I am presence to mend that flaw. You do not need to have to remain in a lesser state than divine perfection. For when the moment comes that you yourself make the necessary resolve and implement that vow, with a continual feeding of your energy into that vow, a God determination. I do not think that there is any power in heaven or earth that can ultimately stop you. Oh, they may stop you for a moment. They may roll you back a few inches. But I tell you, if you keep up that mighty resolve, it will definitely resolve your problems and produce in your world the perfection which Almighty God himself is. You are children of the sun. And as I beam upon you now in taking my leave, I would like very much to release a note of cosmic perfection that is attuned to the level far above a dog whistle that you will not be able to hear with your physical ears, but that will be sounded into the spiritual realm, summoning you to the election of your divine presence. For the election and calling must be made sure by dedication evoked within your own heart flame, precious ones, and then other individuals will have no power to deter you from it. May I release this note out of my heart and out of my mouth by the power of the Logos, the spiritual word. The Indian Council of the Great White Brotherhood sendeth greetings and peace to all in the West. The emanations from the East shall intensify from this day forward. Here in America, 
a spiritual renaissance shall come forth. A new birth of search shall sweep the earth from the east to the west as the lightning Christ mind blazes forth. Materialism as a goal shall vanish from the hearts of many people. The hunger for spiritual things shall increase and intensify and amplify again and again. So be it, my brothers, for the need is great. O Holy Mother, enfold thy planetary children in thy love. Rama, 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 Sita, Ram. I thank you.
gracious brother, Sanat Kumara, holy regents of the flame from the planet Venus, hierarchs and elder brothers assemble in the name of Almighty God and his priceless radiance beamed throughout the earth and conveyed upon wings of light. Let us tonight address the world as in solemn conclave. By the great cross of light and life and love, let us communicate the spirit of a divine union that will foster and encourage mankind in their search for knowledge. Let us point out to the world of men that all the knowledge which mankind have assembled throughout the ages, now currently remaining within the libraries and dossiers of the world, comprises but a pinch of salt compared to the relative knowledge unreleased, unpublished, unknown. Let me point out that that which is not now revealed to mankind is so much more than that which has been revealed, that an attitude of total humility on the part of the family of nations and the human family ought to exist throughout the planetary body, that it might become invocative and evocative within man of a search for a golden age renaissance of culture without the limit and restraint of human stops and dams to prevent the flow of the mighty tides of God's energy released as holy knowledge to a world that is waiting indeed for the sunrise of an age of light. Light is the light of knowledge and it was conveyed in part to the hierarchs of Atlantis. I know for I lived among them and walked among them. I beheld all that they did of nobility and grandeur. I saw their achievements in science and invention. I beheld the minarets of Atlantis and the beautiful sailing vessels which plied the seas of the world. I saw the statues of Atlantis created by a special chemical and alchemical process which to this present day is unknown to mankind. I watched as the glaze, the permanent glaze was applied to these statues which caused them to glisten in the sun with a whiteness which men today have not yet seen. I observed how decadence came into the priesthood and crept in to the masses of mankind as political infidelity spread abroad throughout that land and among the priesthood as well. I saw how the powers of dissolution worked no miracle except to bring despondency to the youth who were waiting and looking to the aged and mature to bring forth some form of salvation against the creeping paralysis of immorality which became prevalent throughout the land. I saw how the beautiful white color of the glistening statues representing the culture of that age was blackened by the sordid despair which corroded men's sense of values and destroyed all the beauty that was ages in accumulating. That which happened, which became reality, that 
which existed, which is the story of Atla, queen of the sea, is a record of man's infamy, a record of man's despair. Today, my brothers, mankind again stands at the crossroads of the ages. Cities have been builded that exceed the grandeur of Atlantis in some scales of value, but are depleted from their level in another sense. Knowledge flourishes throughout the earth, and it seems as though disease and the problems of mankind may in the near future be solved by the promises of an intelligent science. Yet those of us who know the law through the experience of having lived in that era now of the dim past are well aware of the fact that no science of mankind can ever substitute for the holy science of divine understanding, the holy and beautiful philosophic wisdom of divine grace, the Blessed Virgin Theosophia, holy wisdom. We know that holy wisdom wedded to holy science is the acumen of divine intelligence which as a torch cuts through strong metal will produce an etching upon the souls of men which will stop the forces that decay society and produce faithlessness in mankind betrayed by their own age and their compeers sworn to protect them, but unfaithful to their vows. Now then, my brothers of light, as we gaze upon the sea of humanity as a whole and see the lights dancing upon the waves, we are aware of the fact that as in the days of Sodom of old, there are men of strong virtues here, men of strong virtues in the world of form, who individually, if they could, would staunch the flow of human filth and degradation into the world. But they, as the small boy with his finger in the dike, cannot, for the whole is too great, and the requirements of the hour are for the many to rally in the cause of light's perfection and for the sake of the souls of men, that holy knowledge come again to mankind because they have evoked it and demanded it. Knowledge does not come into manifestation, O gracious ones, without a search and without effort and without a continual sifting of the sands of time and space whereby the law of man's being is served because he desires to serve a righteous cause and considers the search for true knowledge, for truth, to be a righteous cause. You cannot expect that the errors of the centuries will be mended in a moment or by a simple desire, would to God it were so. It is necessary that the sifting of this time shall come whereby men shall weigh not only their own hearts, but the destiny of the ages now past and the destiny of this time now present, seeing the screen of the future as a vast and beautiful realm of opportunity. Opportunities have come and opportunities have gone, but men and women who have dedicated themselves to a cause and have seen that cause fulfilled, whether it be at outer levels or at inner levels, are impelled to bend the knee at either level with gratitude in their heart to Almighty God because they have had a part in it. When the veil is parted, 
and the naked souls of men stand before the presence of life and bear witness to that which they have done to further the primal causes of life in an age which is caught up in material strife and when the light of spiritual knowledge was indeed dim, will behold in the etchings which they have made a graceful and beautiful activity which will serve them as a diadem of light down through the ages. Men will walk, mind you, precious ones, in their own light. They have walked in darkness. They have walked in the darkness of ignorance. They have walked in the darkness of disobedience. They have walked in the darkness of their own human self surfeited by their own doings of iniquity. They have reaped what they have sown, but the mercy of the law, as was conveyed of old by Shakespeare in the writings so clearly defining the law of mercy, are a gentle rain falling upon the earth beneath that is twice blessed, to bless him who gives and him who takes. Mercy and the drops of mercy have rendered the law of life compassionate to the nth degree, to the uttermost farthing. And yet, the law has been fulfilled in other cases to the last farthing. Men ask themselves, is God partial? They ask themselves, is the law partial? I tell you, nay, but partiality generated within the heart of the Godhead is created by faith in the justice of God within the domain of the individual. Those who believe that God is unjust may find him so because they have projected this concept into the screen of the future which has revealed itself into their own world as the sowing of a just God, which they have turned awry. Let men now cognize the effect which they have upon the universe. For even the night side of the universe is affected by man's misappropriation of the light, and much which mankind have externalized has been done because they have created a God made in their own image. Men do not realize how that an activity of human creation, whereby energy is drawn from the heart of God and then misqualified, does create a pattern in their world which can be a substitute for the God of very gods. This anthropomorphic God which men create made in their own image is not the reality of the eternal father, but it does in many cases administer a form of justice to themselves which they have evoked by their misapprehension of the law. Let men then judge clearly that to understand God, to understand their own mighty I am presence is one of the greatest blessings of spiritual knowledge which can ever come to anyone. For to understand the position of eternal perfection in its relationship to mankind caught in the net of their own delusion is to cause them to seek to extricate themselves from that web of delusion and find the mighty golden thread which, as the golden ball cast before Atlanta, was indeed the thread of holy knowledge permeating a universe founded upon the knowledge of truth, life, light, and love. You do not realize, O oh grateful ones and gracious ones, how that a mere and simple statue created by an artist grand, such as Leonardo da Vinci, can be made, so to speak, to come alive in consciousness and affect the lives of millions of people. How many people do you suppose have gazed upon the Paita with gratitude and reverence in their heart and have rejoiced in the thought of the sacrifices of Mary, of her son, 
long ago in the land of Galilee. Yet I say to you, there have been many sons that have been sacrificed by many mothers, and they have not been so honored. Men then must understand that it is the intent of the Divine One in the light of holy knowledge to honor all the entire creation. But when the creation dishonors itself, when men turn against the God of very gods by supposing that he himself is unjust, do they not create the matrix which in their own world will bring to them the bitter fruit filled with the ashes of their own iniquity? This may not seem to some to be just, but it is the fulfillment of the law of man's being which has demanded of life that which he has had faith in. Therefore, consider and ponder, O oh beloved ones, how important it is, not only in this day, but in every age, to be careful with your energies. Your energies are the stream of life which you are qualifying every day by your thoughts and feelings. When you charge into the world of form, your thoughts and your feelings, they do not merely affect your own world, but they affect the total world in which you live. And strange as it may seem to some, there is an exportation of the energies of this planet out into instellar space. Those of you of a scientific bent familiar with the laws of nature are aware of the ring past not, past about the earth, which mankind have sought to shatter through the power of telemetry and rocketry and by the puny science now presently engaged in reaching out into space to penetrate the knowledge of distant orbs. You ought to understand clearly how that there is concern in the Father's house of many mansions about the intents of the mankind of earth to perform an act of goodness or an act of evil toward other parts of life in the system of worlds in which you dwell. Ask yourself this question, beloved ones. Ask yourself this question well and ponder it sternly and long. Has this world, according to the record of its own history, exhibited to the mankind of this world a history of peace or a history of war? Ask yourself whether or not your fellow men are exhibiting now attitudes of compliance with brotherly love. Ask yourselves if the life evolutions upon other systems of worlds are justified in looking askance upon any attempt by the mankind of Earth to penetrate the solar radiance and carry themselves to other parts of the universe. Ask yourselves if you were upon another system of worlds or in another part of the universe and you were dwelling in a relative state of happiness and peace if you would look with favor upon the exportation of substance into your world from a star of darkness where the people live and dwell in a state of lethargic consciousness and mortal density. Ask yourselves if you dwelled upon a world where the Christ was honored 1,000 times as much as ye honor him, if you would look with favor upon an exportation into your world of the thoughts and feelings of the mankind of such a dark star. Understand then that a second look at the mankind of Earth by beings from other planets with an advanced understanding of life is perhaps in perfect cosmic order. And if you were possessed with a superior science, ask yourself this question as to whether or not you might even ponder the possibility of seeking to deter the mankind of such an evolution from advancing in their scientific intent until they had first advanced in their spiritual prowess and progress. As I address you, O mankind of Earth, this night, in the name of the Great White Brotherhood, I am calling to your attention the need to assess your own state of progress individually. 
I am calling to your attention the need to assess the planetary evolution collectively. You cannot live in a world where the activities of any part of life are ignored. You must recognize that you have decided through mortal jurisprudence to restrain individuals of a hostile tendency behind bars. You must recognize that when you have recognized in people homicidal and destructive tendencies and paranoid manifestations, you have confined such individuals to asylums and places where they could receive treatment. Then, is it not clearly understandable to the evolutions of this earth that there may indeed be a reason for creating a situation of quarantine upon a planet where the forces of darkness lodged in the mind and hearts of people is indeed in effect a form of mental bacteria. Would you desire to have that bacteria of mental malfunction, of emotional turbulence and upheaval exported into your world? Rather, would you not seek and desire to have a spiritual expansion of consciousness and unfoldment first take place in that world, which would clearly demonstrate in the sociological world of man his desire to live at peace with his neighbors in order that he might achieve through the hand of science and nature and through nature's God the fullness of that golden age unfoldment which is the light of the cosmic Christ made manifest in each individual heart as the second coming of Christ into the world of the individual to assert its dominion over that world as the manifestation of universal good and the preeminence of that good toward all mankind. My brothers, the light that is in you, the golden torch of knowledge, ought to be held high. And as you hold it high, you should recognize that true knowledge seeks for the betterment of all men. It is not intended to serve the needs of any selfish group, nor one segment of mortal society, but to provide a full measure of opportunity to every part of life to complete the unfoldment of the divine plan upon a planetary scale. As we ponder the parts of the world today that are dwelling in what amounts to a relative state of almost total darkness, where men and women are unable to read even their daily newspaper or write their own name, we are reminded of the need to assuage mankind's thirst for temporal knowledge. When we look then at mankind's lack of sociological reform in this current age, we are reminded again of the selfish stops and barriers which man have created within their own world, which do not provide an impetus or a platform upon which they can safely walk, knowing that their fellow men will give them assistance when they require it. Rather, too often, there is the plunging of the dagger into the back when the back is turned, and the flow of human bloodshed upon this planet is indeed appalling to the lords of karma. The fount of human blood today, taken in its flood tide, is in excess by far of that in the days of righteous Abel. Let men then know and realize that the murders that take place within the larger cities of the world do reach up unto the lords of karma and unto heaven. That the injustices mankind are leveling upon one another are of frightening proportions. That the elemental parts of life have sobbed themselves to sleep again and again because they know that the karmic toll now mounting must eventually bring forth a terrific upheaval and cataclysmic action which will deplete large areas of the world of their population and render many habitable parts of the world uninhabitable 
unless mankind shall seriously take a collective look at that which is currently distressing man in the world of sociological aspect. Let men recognize also how that religious knowledge has today become an activity of splinter and schism. Division is the order of the day when unity is needed by the mankind of earth. The hierarchies of the various religions of the world actually engage in psychological warfare against one another. And some of them are resorting, precious ones, to spiritual attacks in the sense that they are praying for the destruction of those who ought to be called their brothers, who to them are in reality their enemies. With the world conditions as they are today, is it not then essential that mankind shall have a more full-orbed light of spiritual knowledge which will bring into manifestation the broadening powers of cosmic illumination to put an end to this ignorance which permits them to make peace with feelings within their heart which are hostile. Hostility is within their heart and prayers are upon their lips and these are strange bedfellows to the ascended masters. We call these things to your attention not in order to create a feeling of depression, O oh, gracious ones, but to show you the degree to which mankind in this present hour are oppressed by the delusions of the senses and the lack of spiritual practicality. Spiritual practicality then is the order of the day and as we seek to release tonight the fire of our knowledge into the world of form, it is with a desire to activate certain forces of a key nature, what we will term key orderers in the world of form, to produce matrices of great illumination charged with cosmic radioactivity. Therefore, I am asking the lords of karma for a special grant this night to spread abroad holy illumination's flame in cooperation with the god and goddess Meru. I am asking that there be anchored in every university in this land that is receptive to knowledge, especially to knowledge revealed from the higher octaves, a mighty transcendent golden flame of illumination which shall pulsate 300 feet into the atmosphere above each university and shall day after day, hour after hour, radiate ascended master light into the force field of the students who are attending these universities. I am asking that that force field be created this night and this day, this hour, by God's own light and power of illumination, sustained then for all time to come as foci of the sacred fire. I am asking that a fixation be made of these flames, that as the great light blazed forth of old in Atlantis, in the Incalithalon, so the great maxim light will now blaze forth as the maximum light of cosmic knowledge within the campuses and force fields of the universities of the world and also within the divinity and theological schools of the world to create a theological concept based upon divine practicality. Mankind have the knowledge of the law. Mankind have comprehension. They have understanding, but they do not use it. And knowledge unused often passes quickly from the screen of consciousness until it is no longer a thing of beauty and a joy forever but rather it becomes a mere bric-a-brac in the mental attic of their world, cast aside and repudiated by their actions, even as they have cast aside unused garments and things that have outlived their usefulness. You must understand tonight that as I am speaking to you, it is in defense of America and of the ideals of the free world, that it is in defense of liberty for mankind and that it is in defense of the possibility of a spiritual renaissance as we match the activities of the Brothers of the Shadow by creating an activity of great light 
point and counterpoint, point and counterpoint, point and counterpoint in the world of form, point and counterpoint in the world of the mind, point and counterpoint within the spirit of man, an activity that is designed to act as a radioactive potent force that cannot be denied entrance into the world of the receptive heart. There are many receptive hearts in the world of form, gracious ones, and these receptive hearts are crying out and are athirst for the light of spiritual knowledge. The ancient torches which were fired within this world in times past, which enabled nobility to expand and spread as wings of light over the lands, is today the requirement of the hour, and every child of light upon this planet longs for the moment of liberation, when the bells of liberty will peal out throughout the world, extending to the world the cup of hope in light and life and love, the cup of hope that can be the great anthem of the free in a future when destiny is commanded as it is now ignored. Destiny is ignored today, because mankind are ignorant of divine practicality. And I will ding this word into your ears and fix it into your hearts and your heart's energy so that you will understand as you set your hand to the plow of life and say to yourself, I will plow a straight furrow. You will remember my words and you will say to yourself, this must be a practical manifestation for the glory of God and the glory of God is reflected in the fallow earth as that earth is turned over and the good seed is impregnated into the waiting hungry ground to spring up as renewed hope in the hearts of mankind who are sick and tired of all of the human innuendo and they are sick and tired of human fashions and they are sick and tired of all that mankind have sought to do which has brought them no contentment or permanent happiness but only a continual search without end and without fulfillment. Now by the light of cosmic knowledge and by the mind of God infused as the sacred fire element into the campuses of the universities and thence into the domain of the human heart where it will expand knowledge and make it practical, men will find that they can work together as never before because there is wedded to the spirit of man the alchemical tie which came forth from the heart of God in the beginning and is the chemical marriage that weds spirit and matter together to function within the domain of cosmic predictability. In the present hour, the ascended masters cannot even predict from one hour to the other what mankind will do for willy-nilly individuals are constantly functioning within the domain of mortal folly. Each folly that they create is worse than the other and a rupture has occurred between the Holy Spirit of life that is within them and the domain of reasonability. Mankind function completely out of human reason and out of human logic. They are moved and motivated by the desire to expand the ego in the domain of mankind each one seeking to perpetuate name and fame for themselves and ignoring the right of life which demands that their heads, hands, and hearts be merged together in one cosmic threefold activity of service to mankind and service to nature's God. I say to you in the words of the immortal constitution of this great land, hear ye well, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Equal in opportunity, but not equal in activity. For the mankind of this planet, if one twentieth of them, or even two percent of them, had bent their hand to the plow of noble effort for their nation, voluntarily given, we would find today that this land would not be giving forth a stench of darkness and abomination and yet, I tell you that this land in the present hour is radiating more light than any other country upon the earth. Yet it is not enough, for the light of holy knowledge is the requirement of the hour, and it is the requirement of every hour, and it is the requirement of the golden age of the future when destiny will be directed by the law of God through activated hearts 
cleansed and purified because they have faith in Almighty God and his sacred fire to do it. They will submit themselves to the blue lightning of my love, the Father has said. And as they submit themselves to the blue lightning of my love, there will go forth with the aurora of the dawning a new age when the children of the future instructed by the angels themselves who will appear to them at a very early time will show to a waiting world that the sunrise of divine love is the light of heaven's knowledge beamed forth from the great golden fount of that knowledge, a knowledge that is God, a knowledge that is good, a knowledge that is resurgent, a knowledge that is Christ illumination, a knowledge that is the wave of the future reaching out and seeking to let its reach exceed the grasp. Won't you please be seated? Ladies and gentlemen, may I plead to the few who are here who may have other things to do to wait a moment upon the Lord. For I tell you that that which I am releasing is released by the hand of the great white brotherhood into the mental belt of this planet and it is designed to be picked up by waiting minds and hearts throughout the world. If I am to cut that short because of the pressing demands of individuals, it will cause mankind who are hungering and thirsting after the law to be cheated of that law. I therefore plead for your indulgence in the name of Almighty God I tell you there are many important things which you have to do in this world of form, but there is nothing as important as immortality and service. What is the value of immortality, precious ones, if it cannot be an immortality when service can be rendered to an oncoming life wave? And this brings to our mind the fact that the divine creativity of God is an endless process not one which comes to an eschatological end. We want to point out to you that the light of the cosmic Christ is a tangible, radiant manifestation, that this knowledge is that which enables mankind to appropriate by divine catalytic action all that is written and recorded of value in all of the books that are written in the world and also all that is of cosmic value which mankind have not yet externalized simply because they have not lived in manifestation long enough to do so. Recognize then that we desire to expand compassion to the world of form. What a strange thing it would be, O oh gracious ones, if the waiting among mankind would find their request denied. What a sad thing it would be if mankind would seek and could not find. What if they would indeed cry for the rocks and the mountains to fall upon them, to cover them, to cause them to have faith in a way of escape that would be denied to them. Is not the mountain of God's cosmic law a worthy and gracious outpouring to mankind? Do you recall the words of old that those who harm one of these little ones of mine by doing so would be given through the power of the returning currents of the law a greater punishment than if a millstone were cast round about their neck and they were cast into the sea. Do you recall the words how that mankind ought to fall upon the rock and be broken rather than let the rock fall upon them and grind them to powder? Precious ones, through the light of the Christ knowledge of life, you can fall upon the rock and be broken as an individual, as a person, as a matrix unfulfilled. And then the hand of an infinite God will raise you up, not mutilated, not broken, not destroyed, but raise you up in the name of the living Christ and make of you a light in the world. 
a child of balance, a child who holds the threefold flame of life, love, wisdom, and power in cosmic esteem and seeks to balance the bodies of man that perfection may manifest in the world of form. This is the fiat of the hour. It is the requirement of the world, a thirst for knowledge. Heed our call and assist us if you can. Accept our love if you cannot. But know that our light is with you always, even to the end of the age. And ye dwell in the moments of that end and know it not. The signs have appeared and have passed. And the coming of culmination trembles over the brink of the hours. Yet hope is a light in all the sky. And through the firmament, the arrows of brightness the arrows of his appearing are blazing forth by cosmic power with unerring and unswerving aim they seek to purify and perfect they seek to cleanse and direct they are the law fulfilled in their very movement and when they arrive upon this planet they will bear no hostility to man but only grace that commands life free in the light of cosmic knowledge. My brothers of light ascended, may I invoke then in thy name in the universities of the world the light of the holy divine maxim of the law, the maxims of cosmic truth, the law of the one, out of one I commanded many, and they came forth. Out of my oneness I shall bid mankind return, and they shall come forth. Out of the sea they shall come forth to me, and they shall rejoice. I am the Lord thy God that brought thee out of the land of bondage. I am the great God command, be free. I am the great God command that sets men free. I am the great God command that breaks the matrices of false creation. I am the law fulfilled through all creation. Heed and hear my word fulfilled Heed and hear my word, God willed. I am, I am, I am the lamp, the lamp of knowledge bold, the door, the door of holy illumination gold. I say now pass right through that door and pass right through my flame. I say, O oh men, pass through this door in God's own holy name. I say, pass through to life and destiny of light. I say, pass through that door and bend the bow aright. I command thee free. I command thou me. Be as I am. Be free, command and know. Be free, command and glow with light and lumination's power and might that fills every hour with freedom's joy and happiness and every light of God's success. Oh, set free and be, command me now, for I will serve to heed thy vow and help thee with my light. I flow tonight abroad and scatter in the earth, not as seeds of darkness, but as seeds of worth, seeds of holy worth, seeds of holy God's success. Take it, use it, drink it, do not abuse it. It is my proffered gift, my aim for thee. I give it gladly, for I thy God am free.
precious ones, on behalf of the Grand Council of the Great and Royal Tetons, on behalf of the spirit of the Great White Brotherhood, and in the name of Almighty God, the one principle of life, the mighty I am of universal law, I bid you adieu. May God speed thee on thy way where thou canst view all life from our position, not in ivory tower bold, but in a place where life will hold a new and wondrous sense, the sense of knowledge perfected in man, in action, in God. I, Lanto, on behalf of the hierarchy, salute you. May the wings of the morning enfold you, and may the light of the eternal brotherhood unceasingly flow into the domain of thy cup of consciousness. Peace in heart, in head, in hand. Peace in God's command.